we often hear the the expression seeing is believing and i flip that and i said no 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 i now get it believing is seeing because we believed it that people were dying because of scarcity and therefore that's what we saw when clearly we there was more than enough and more than enough potential for all of us and that we were creating the human made systems that denied people the power to access that food <laughs>
because then you could live on one postdoc salary. My husband was a postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley, and we could live on his meager income and live fine. And so I could just do what I wanted to do. And guess what? I had access to all of the tools in the UC Berkeley Agricultural Library. So that's where I hung out with a friendly librarian. You know, this is before the internet and even before handheld calculators. I had my dad's slide rule, which probably most of our listeners don't even know what that is. So fortunately, I had access to these terrific resources in the friendliness and the helpfulness of librarians. And I literally kind of was putting two and two together because we were told that great suffering was present and ahead of us because we were hitting the limits of a finite earth. And Paul Ehrlich at Stanford had just published The Population Bomb. And it was just exploding. And there was also a doctrine called the uh, paper, uh, The Tra Tragedy of the Commons, Garrett Hardin wrote uh, about that same time, the late 60s, saying that any resource that was shared in common would inevitably be overrun. That's just who we are, our selfish nature. We couldn't cooperate to save our resources. And so there was a great sense of doom of just, we were, you know, we were really, you know, uh, lost. I mean, we were just, um, and at the same time, there were famines in Africa that were reinforcing this idea that we'd hit the earth's limits and that famine was inevitable. And later then, there was this doctrine of the lifeboat ethic. It was even worse saying, well, we're going to have to let many people die because we can't feed everyone. So I thought, oh, <laughs> if I could just dive into food, what's more basic? Nothing's more basic besides, of course, food, air, and water. And I thought, oh, if I could understand why hunger, is this really true? And, you know, hunger, food is quantifiable. We all relate to it. We all are interested in food, right? Um, it's, it's, we know what, what good nutrition is. All of that's known. So if I could figure this out, that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics, and I would have direction. That's what I wanted. I wanted to know a life path that made sense. So there I was, and really very soon in that process, I was just shocked because I said, wait a minute, there's no scarcity. Yes, there's the experience of scarcity, but we're creating that. Uh, but I, I really got very clear that there was enough food for us all. And if you weren't eating, it wasn't because of any absolute lack of food. It's because you didn't have access. You didn't have power to access the food that is being grown. And so pretty soon in the process, I started saying, hunger is not caused by a scarcity of food. It's caused by scarcity of democracy, because that was my shorthand for every one of us having voice, which is to me the ultimate definition of democracy. Nobody is left out. Um, so that was the beginning. And, and I was terrified, Mark, that, you know, maybe I'd misplaced a decimal point or something. But, you know, I've come to believe over the years, and I, I'm curious if you would agree with this, that there is something really helpful about fresh eyes, about somebody not trained as a nutritionist, not trained as a developmental economist, and just coming in and saying, oh, is there enough, you know? And so I think in some ways, my lack of training was an asset uh, because I could see right in front of my eyes, there it was. And, and later in life, and this is a theme of all of my, my more recent work, is that human beings uh, are very special in the animal kingdom with our complicated brains. We don't see the world as it is, but as we are, and that we see through filters and we literally can't see what doesn't fit inside our filter. And so we often hear the, the expression, seeing is believing, and I flip that. And I say, no, 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 no. And I now get it, believing is seeing, because we believed it that people were dying because of scarcity, and therefore that's what we saw, when clearly we, there was more than enough and more than enough potential for all of us, and that we were creating the human-made systems that denied people the power to access that food. And so I, that's become a theme song of my life, you know, the believing is seeing. And I often have 
have uh, stories, simple stories to tell about myself that I could share or not. But um, um, that um, is still true today, that that are even truer than ever. Um, and it explains, I think, so much about our avoidance and our conflict is that we live with these filters and we don't recognize that uh, we are what as uh, I quote Albert Einstein though because he is very credible and he says it is theory which decides what we can observe and that absolutely is a way of saying it so that was really the beginning for me and shaped everything going forward and originally you know I just wanted to share with friends because I thought I had great news Mark guess what you know it's not inevitable we human beings are creating this terrible blight of hunger so we human beings can change it we're not fated to to hunger and so it was in the beginning it was just wanting to share wanting to share that that we have the power and so i did a one-page handout and then you know you probably had this experience oh i should know a little bit more about that you know and then i should know a little bit more about that and so it kept growing and then got into the hands of a Brit uh, British implant in the U.S., uh, Betty Ballantyne, who she and her husband co-founded Paperback Publishing in America. And so my fate was that my little beginning manuscript got into her hands via a friend. And uh, she said, well, you know, um, can I tell you a story about when I got to thank her uh, just a few years ago? She died at Please. almost 100. She lived almost to 100. But I went to visit her to thank her again. And I went to her home in New York and I said, Betty, why did you take a chance on me? <laughs> I hadn't published anything, not even a letter to the editor of a newspaper. And she just twinkled and smiled and she said, Frankie, it was your ideas. It was your ideas. If you couldn't write the book, hey, I could do that, <laughs> she said. So that was when publishing was really about people who really cared and wanted to get transformative ideas out and I just love that she had confidence that the ideas were more important than whether I could do a good job in writing and so we agreed on every word in the book well uh, well we discussed this before we started the recording but um, I have an old uh, first edition that I, my grandmother had and she had uh, a lot of her recipes that she even kind of tweaked and fine-tuned off of that That's and it was very tattered and torn and Personal pages idea. yeah and she she'd even written on the pages and I still have it um I was I was only one year old when it came out 1971 but it, you were at the crux of a really a lot was going on in in, in the world uh, as you mentioned um you know, a, a few of the trendy things that, that we hear about or might might uh, associate with is, you know, the, the launch of the quarter pounder for McDonald's was in 1971. Starbucks uh, launched in, in 1971 with um, their first uh, uh, Starbucks coffee and, and establishment. Willy Wonka, the movie uh, came out, uh, which was uh, three million U.S. dollars by Quaker Oats, um, but also <laughs> there was some things happening just before that, like uh, the Earthrise, the first catalog image of our planet, came out um, uh, December twenty fourth, nineteen sixty eight, and then a few years later, one at one year after the book was published, the first catalog image of our complete uh, Earth, the blue marble, came out as well. And there was this big thing that I also see in what your your story or, or kind of hear out in the story you just told about your research and that that you went to kind of get this expertise or this kind of better look in, into the food systems and to the basics of our life and, and had this wonderful luckily Berkeley in the library and the probably the the plethora of information and resources you you had there was amazing but as you 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 got into that there instead of 
going in deeper with these blinders, it's almost like you had this overview effect, this cosmic perspective as well, that gave you a bigger picture or a bigger history of kind of where the food systems was coming from and, and where what the trajectory you were seeing at the moment where it was going and um, how, how there was some really weird things in there. And I saw, so I see a couple of things, not only a fabulous time that you were around, uh, were, were all these very similar to what we're experiencing now, these dis-ease, these moments of unrest where we have Black Lives Matters, we have uh, Asian racism, we have the inauguration, we have um, a lot of craziness uh, uh, going on in po politics, but also, the COVID and, and um, humanity in general, not just the United States, is feeling this dis-ease with what's going on with our systems, what's going on with our democracy, what's going on with our food systems that's meant to sustain us or to give us our basic energy source, but yet it's creating enormous amounts of human suffering and uh, dis-ease in the world and creating huge climate catastrophes out of that. And uh, I think you were seeing some of that then. But that leads me to this, this true question, this first really important question. You've been doing this now in September 50 years. And you've been talking about not just food and had your food books, but you've been talking a lot about activism and democracy and how we can play an active role in kind of shaping our future. And then 2020, we were hit with this pandemic and some craziness. I, I want to know, all these 50 years, has that proven to be a better model for life? Has there proven somewhere in there some nuggets of wisdom or some systems or models that can help us weather storms or weather pandemics or weather crazy times like this a little bit either easier that prove to be a, a, a better a better model to get us on the right side of history or on the right side of the future we want to reach that's a big question and what comes to mind uh i've been really thinking about the role of fear because 1969 leading up to the publication of my book that was an era as i mentioning that was driven by fear, that we have hit the limits. I mean, I knew young women who didn't want to have children, felt it was unethical to have children, fear that that, that was evil, in fact, that you were overburdening the earth. So it was a very fear-driven driven time that actually distracted us from the deeper relational understanding that hunger was a product of our relationships with one another, one another, the rules and norms that we create, and we can't blame nature, we can't throw it that way. So fear was a handicap at that time, the way it was used. The question for us right now is that fear is very appropriate. Can we use it for wisdom? Is it ever been possible in human history where people were terrified and actually energized them to clarity, not to blame, uh, either blame the Earth's limits or blame each other as so endemic in our culture that uh, Donald Trump has encouraged, uh, but rather to see once and for all that we sink or swim together, it's all related. Um, since we're all connected, we're all implicated, and we're also all potentially part of the solution. So that's the challenge for this moment. Can fear serve a very different energy. And that's what I hope that my work will always contribute to. Um, and because we know the solutions, uh, there's much loss that has already happened as a result of climate catastrophe and economic, you know, economic uh, concentration has already cost lives and, and great losses of, of uh, the natural world. But it's not all lost, uh, obviously. Uh, we still have a chance to save a great number of species, including our own. So that's that's my short, I mean, my overall answer is, is that how do we turn fear into constructive 
where we see, and to me it's, it's so interesting about diet for a small planet because that word small could be taken to mean scare, skimpy, right? Not enoughness. Or it could be taken to mean what I really wanted it to mean is diet for a related interrelational planet that we're small in the sense that we're all connected um, and therefore we're all implicated and all part of the solution. And so uh, I want to emphasize that that I reject the um, the small is a great a great title. I still like it, and it, maybe it was inspired now that you mention it from the first time we saw the our little our little globe. You know um, that, but hopefully that little globe encouraged us to see our solidarity possibilities. You know that we're all in partnership to save life on this little sphere. So does that? I it totally makes sense, and and uh, I'll t I'll tell you because that's all I can go from is the 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 way I hear it, and and the, is exactly what you said. So it's this kind of this the Earth rise. It's the the blue marble. It's showing us, yeah, it's not small because we're scarce and we we we're you know, but that we're all interconnected. We're all humans on the spaceship Earth, and and. Uh, this is another beautiful thing I like about all your books, but especially Diet for a Small Planet, is that um, it, it is the whole planet. Even though it's very much Berkeley and the United States and it's America, you never took that full view that, okay, it's just America, America, America. It's really this whole planet and how even in America, the diets in America are really influencing things all over the world and they're interconnected, that it's really this system, this symbiotic earth, but also the spaceship earth, as a Buckminster Fuller uh, so nicely put it, that we're, you know, we're on this spaceship earth. He, I think he was the second person to co coin the term. The first person was Kenneth Boulding, who is an ecological economist um, that originally co uh, coined the term. But I, I really love the fact that you kind of give us this whole perspective that we're all drinking the same water. We're all breathing the same air. We're all eating the same food. And it's, you know, no matter how big our small planet is eventually there is no place to hide from the finite resources of this planet and the interconnectedness of humanity one from another now I, we're really here to talk about diet for a small planet but you have another book hope's edge uh that you did with your daughter anna and uh in there you also you kind of traveled the world and you met amazing people and you heard other stories of farmers and people around the world dealing with with issues on food systems um wangari uh, matai a uh, uh, noble laureate a tr uh, tree planner a wonderful woman who who just says we need more trees we need to heal our soils we need to get restore the soil in our in our land and and really kind of uh, get these basic rights back something's missing and did amazing things but you have stories like that where you says you know we're not this isn't planet america this is planet spaceship earth you know and um the the basic when we break everything down our our economies are really food our basics, our energy source is food. And uh, the, how can we do it in a better way? How can we have a diet that works on, on a planet that's interconnected? And so there, this 50th anniversary is not just the same, uh, a, a new printing or a new edition. You've actually done some updates. Uh, you've taken us out of uh, what you've in and, and fine-tuned it to the younger generation as well, but also added some extra voices. And so I'd like to hear maybe a little bit about some more things that went in there, if you don't mind, and, and, and what we can hope to expect and why it rings just as true as it did 50 years ago. But it's, it's one that you're, a lot of people are saying, 
boy, we've been talking about food for 50 years. Why, why is this the first time I'm hearing about this? Yes, yes, yes. You know, I, the way that I put it in myself and in, in, in the book is that, yes, in 1971, when the book came out, the plant-centered eating, moving to, I call it now, plant and planet-centered eating, uh, was a great idea. It was a good choice. It was very helpful then, but now is an absolute necessity for life on Earth. That it, so it shifted from a positive thing to an essential, an absolute essential step. And largely because of climate catastrophe pending, and, um, and that all is all also connected to the destruction of rainforests um, and species decimation. And so I begin with, um, Early in the new chapter for the new edition, I quote David Attenborough, the esteemed um, 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 natural historian, who says that we are on the brink of the sixth great extinction. And he very much says that without changing the way we eat to free up vast amounts of land to re re-inhabit re with diverse species the all because we've wiped out so many uh, that we we really are lost so in that uh, especially added to that the impact of of climate heating so um, it just the sense of urgency and the sense of um, the more rich various reasons why for health reasons ecological reasons economic reasons um, uh, climate reasons that a plant-centered diet is a one way to make a significant dent. Um, in fact, on the climate question, I quote professors at the University here in the United States who said that that if we really shifted to a plant-centered diet, that that would be the, the equivalent in climate correction to taking all of the traffic off the roads in, worldwide. It's it's that kind of of impact because food and agriculture, our food system, contributes 37% of greenhouse gas emissions. And among those is methane, particularly from, from cows, and methane packs a particular climate punch, if you will, so that there's extra uh, gain by, by limiting, certainly um, beef consumption, but in general, livestock offer such a uh, way, you know, that bang for your buck, if you will, or bang for your shift, that, um, that I, I, I feel like, yeah, it's uh, every reason in the world. I could go on about health and, and cost and every, all different dimensions that I bring forth in the uh, kind of list of why we are shifting to a plant-centered diet. Yeah, the, the one, one of the biggest um, fallacies or kind of misnomers that we've been led to believe over the years is that the automotive, the oil, coal, and gas industry, the fossil fuel industry are the biggest cause of human suffering and environmental, ecological destruction, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're, they're on the list. They're probably eight, nine, or 10 on the list of the top 10. But the one that really affects us all and creates the most amount of human suffering, greenhouse gas emissions, and environmental destruction is really agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industries, and the high processing, the type of aromas, flavors, pesticides, chemicals, fertilizers, and fossil fuels that go in to keep this this entire industry afloat and running this big capitalistic machine. Uh, I, so I think that's a, a big mistake or that people kind of thought, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not food, but it's actually our food that we touch every, every day, hopefully. Hopefully we're all eating a couple times a day and it's our basic energy source. You know, they, um, we have to regulate our body temperature at 98.6 degrees to keep, keep our body warm and our motor running. And the way we do that is food, food and water. And they call it a, a, a measurement of energy, a 
caloric unit or a calorie. And I, by no means, please, I don't want anybody to count calories. I don't believe in it at all. But what I want you to know is that's the basic energy source of humanity. It's, it's what regulates our body temperature and it's a measurement of energy. And the basic energy source for humanity isn't fossil fuels and it isn't cars and it isn't gas, it's, it's food and water. And so you hit on the nail and the reason it ties to economics and democracy is because that's the basic driver of, of life on earth. And, and so it automatically makes sense to tie into that. The, the shift, and I don't know uh, um, if you would like to go into this a little bit, is that in 2008, we had a big, huge shift where pretty much all investments during the financial crisis in 2008 kind of shifted from, from financial markets to tech markets to real estate markets to anything to do with our food systems. And it really turned food into a commodity. But even back in 1971, there were some strong things going on where this, this beginning of shift of turning food into a commodity, into certain things, which um, when you turn food into a commodity, the people who produce the food are so disconnected uh, from the food because they're being run by investors and commodities and stocks and trades and things that we cheapen food. I, I often say I have an addiction to cashews and um, uh, sometimes I'll, I, I, my addiction is so bad, I'll pop a, a handful of cashews in my mouth while I've just eaten a whole tree. And I've just probably wasted the maku maku fruit, which is on top of the cashew. And um, I paid a one euro for it. I'm in Hamburg, Germany, and I paid one euro for it. No way is that the true cost of of a handful of cashews. And we're not paying the true cost, the natural capital, the resources, and all this, and, and, and the short of it is, is when we cheapen food, we cheapen life. And, and I just want everybody to be clear, if we cheapen life, we're cheapen us, we're cheapening humanity. And so I, I, I really think that you're, you've touched upon it and you talk about it, you tie into many other things with democracy, with food. What are some other learning lessons that uh, we, where we can really see food as, a powerful thing where we can get control back of our democracy, of, of our life, of our infrastructure, our futures. Well, I want to start by by underscoring, and you've what you've said really sets me up for this expression that uh, sh moving our diet, plant centering it, planet centering it. Um, I mean by that, you know, its effect on climate um, and species decimation. So this notion that our food choices affect the earth. But the great thing for me is that it's a win, 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 because we now know that as you were saying, our diet, uh, the commercial diet, the agribusiness concentrated offerings are an increasing threat to our health. That now um, the leading causes of disease are uh, all you know, such as uh, heart disease and many cancers are food related, that food is implicated in their cause, the degradation of our food. Uh, the ultra processing of our food robs us of essential nutrients. And so by centering our food in our eating in the whole foods plant world, uh, we, you know, there's just such a win to our health. There's such a win that we go back if we, especially if we uh, attempt to buy locally as possible and support small farmers. And if we choose non-pesticides that is organic, which you don't, you couldn't even choose that in, you know, when I wrote the book, we didn't have a, a label here that said organic. That didn't come really until uh, the very turn of the nineties, right? So now we can choose that and know with every extra dollar we might spend or euro you might spend, um, you are, making a difference. You are voting for the world we not only want, but we have to have to survive. You're voting to, you know, with those extra dollars uh, if you have them. But also to point out that <laughs> that our uh, 
grain-fed, meat-centered, ultra-processed diet also costs us, especially here in the U.S. because we have such a, such a um, terrible healthcare system, that it costs us a lot of money <laughs> to pay for the disease, the diabetes and heart disease, etc., that is caused by this grain-fed, meat-centered, you know, ultra-processed diet. So there's just, you know, we have to keep that in mind when we put a few extra euros on the table, so to speak, uh, on the counter to pay for our richer, more satisfying, more healthy diet. We're also reducing costs elsewhere. And I just want to tell a little story about this is global. Uh, a few years ago, I was in touch with a doctor in southern India who said to me, yes, you know, 20 years ago, my patients were coming to me because they were literally lacking calories. But today, even in southern Indi Indi India, uh, not a, a center of industrialized, you know, West, um, that people now come to me because they're suffering diabetes and heart disease. And uh, when my daughter and I were in India, we'll never forget this image. We were in very rural part of India, driving along, and there were these stand of eucalyptus trees. They themselves are implants from another country. And on these, on these trees were ads, advertisements for Pepsi, Pepsi. You know, when India is famous for these delicious indigenous mango juice and lychee food and such, and yet they were getting hooked on the, you know, on this hyper sugar, you know, hyper sucrose uh, drinks. And so that's what I mean, you know, that um, that the cost is 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 certainly um, greatly greatly increased from when I wrote Diet for Small Planet, uh, and these multiple layers of environmental devastation, uh, not just climate warming directly through these emissions, but through deforestation. I've just learned recently that by best estimate, something like 80% of deforestation in the Amazon, which is, I think, the largest um, rainforest in the world, 80% uh, of that loss is for cattle grazing and feed crops, right? So it's directly, um, we are contributing as we choose that diet, uh, we are contributors <laughs> to the world we don't want to, right? And I don't like to play on people's guilt, but just to offer people real choice. That, and that's why I started with food, you know, because we make those choices, as you said, every single day. And so I've often thought of it as a string around my finger, you know, just, oh yeah, every day I'm making a choice that's either, either promoting a better world for all, including me, or not. And there's not a lot we do every day. You know, we can't change our solar panels. I look up because we have some, but I can't add more every day. But I can. <laughs> I can choose a plant-centered diet that is a whole foods and is supporting uh, farmers who aren't going to be exposed to pesticides because there's such poisoning going on in the world today um, by cancerous, cancer-causing pesticides. Uh, what what a funner, more beautiful way to to do it than by by eating, you know, and and taking that control back. Uh, so so many times in in our world, in our history, in the big history of of, of our of our planet, um, we have seen more than twenty civilization collapse. We've had more than twenty civilizations in our world that aren't here anymore incas aztecs Mayas, early mesopotamia the greeks the romans on and on and they're no longer here um and all but two are no longer here because of an ecological or an environmental collapse and that has to do with um the way they produce food the way that they tr treated the environment the way that they they lived and these were civilizations that were pretty advanced and pretty innovative and had infrastructure and, and were doing some fabulous things. They're no longer here anymore. And so I, I think that this, this key or this uh, area that we've hit upon with food and its importance in our world and, and how we can contribute with what we eat in our diet every single day 
to make a big impact that we're on the right side of history, that we don't end up in a collapse or that uh, we don't lose our civilization because it uh, seems to be like we're repeating some of the same mistakes. You, you mentioned Einstein earlier, his you know definition of insanity problems theory is basically we we can't solve the pro the the problems that we created with the same thinking and that when we created them we have to think differently we have to come up with some better solutions and in our agriculture food and beverage industry industries that are out there we're really still stuck in the dark ages, the middle ages, and in, in a lot of respects, when it comes to processing and producing food, the way we do monoculture farming, the way we use pesticides and chemicals. I mean, around the same time, uh, Rachel Carson's book came out, you know, Silent Spring, talking about pesticides and chemicals and, and, and uh, things that we're doing to our planet. Do you see that... Um, there's a way that we can have a stronger influence to shift those industries um, and regain some of the control of our food and shift those diets that uh, even if the whole world were to switch to a plant-based diet or to uh, um, really a plant-based diet that we would have enough options and enough benefits and enough power to support the world to do that and what are your thoughts and thinkings on that on on kind of that transition and some tools to help us to to feel more empowered because it seems like in some respects people are disconnected from food and and they feel helpless they feel like that's in someone else's hands mm -hmm. yes that's a perfect uh, introduction for me to share that over the years, I've really struggled to answer the question, what does humanity need beyond the physical? What are the essentials that uh, every human being needs? And my tentative, it's always tentative, and push back please, but that it comes out in the trilogy of that we need a sense of agency, in, a, in other words, power, that human beings aren't happy if they are muzzled, that we need meaning beyond just survival. Surviving is not enough. We need a larger meaning. And we need to feel connected with others in that power and larger meaning. And actually, I still get chills when I say this, because I, it's so true for me, and I think it's true for you, Mark, but it's true for everyone I know, that we need to feel those three elements. And so for me, um, Food off is one channel in which we can meet not just our physical needs, but this deep emotional, psychological, human need for power, meaning, and connection. And, and so on a daily basis, we can literally taste it as we make conscious choices and feel good about ourselves that you know our, our dollars or our euros are trickling back to a shift that's healthy. But in addition, and in addition, not but in addition, and in addition, we can feel simultaneously that we are contributing to social movements. And I can really talk mainly about my own country, uh, that we are losing our democracy uh, long before Donald Trump. Uh, and I, just to give you one uh, horrifying statistic, that in the decade after Diet for a Small Planet was published, the number of firms, co corporations that have lobbyists, full-time lobbyists in Washington, D.C., grew 14-fold because the, the what's called um, the Chamber of Commerce here had set, is, had asked a, a, a very respected jurist to write a blueprint for how can the much beleaguered businessman in America, how can they make it? And corporate America listened to that. 14-fold increase in the number of lobbyists. And I hope you in the European community don't allow the kind of pressures from corporate lobbyists that our system allows. But that is just a horrifying statistic. And that now in Washington, I love to, I hate to say, love to remind people that there are now almost two dozen lobbyists, most of them corporate, for every single person that we voted for to represent our interests in Washington. So that is the de democracy deficit, the challenge for 
and and so that's why I feel like I'm walking always on two feet that uh, uh, and I've been very committed to the democracy movement and wrote a book with someone 49 years my junior and we agreed on every word we met marching for democracy in Washington we wrote a book called daring democracy really helping people see what we can do now and how exhilarating it is and so we talk about the thrill of democracy because you know, often here in this culture, at least, democracy is presented as this dull duty that you perform occasionally, you know, every couple of years. And, you know, it's the dull, like, the dull veggie you have to swallow to get your, your yummy, sugary dessert. And no, 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 no. What we argue is that actually being part of a vibrant democracy in which you have uh, a voice is a human thrill you know that you meet strangers you wouldn't have otherwise and you see parts of yourself you wouldn't have known were there and on and on so that's really what um what led into the co-creation of a website called democracymovement.us and uh to allow people quickly to see where they can participate i love that and i appreciate you bringing that up because Believe it or not, all of this ties into an e economic model, uh, economic models that uh, we've we've experienced since since the book came out and way before. Uh, our world is kind of um, pushing back and feeling dis-ease at extractive economies and capitalism and, and democracies that don't work for us anymore, and so. I, I I followed your work. I followed your activism and and what you do, and and it's almost like you're on, you're kind of a, a, a different form of uh, I guess Al Gore. You're you're empowering people with with training and tools, not only through your websites and through your writings, but kind of how can they become active? How can they uh, see things differently? Think critical. How can they regain some of that democracy? And uh, I, I have to be honest, I, I take a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm not negative, but sometimes I wonder, do we have democracy? Is there such a thing? And um, I, I, I love the fact that when Biden got into office, and I'm so glad he did because I, I hated the Oompa Loompa uh, that was in office and all the horrible criminal things that, that happened while, while he was in in office, rolling back the EPA and, and trying to leave the Paris Agreement on and on, um, that that Biden doubled down. He jumped back into the Paris Agreement. He started to, to get back into all the things we need to do for energy and environment and, and, and really say, this is important. This is important for us. But the one thing I'd also hope that he would do is, uh, and I, I hate to bring up Al Gore again, in 2000, wasn't it 2000, the dimple chat and, and the election of Al Gore and, and George Bush, um, we didn't figure out how to figure out how to fix the voting system then. And we didn't figure it out this last year with Donald Trump and Biden with all the drama around there. I would hope that, I was hoping that he would like, we're never gonna have this again. We've got to fix our problems. We've got to fix the system uh, on voting and, and we're in the 21st century, let's get it worked out. And so I guess my question is, can you give me some hope? Do we have democracy or are we still very much teetering on, on democracy? Well, first, let me say that democracy for me is a journey as one of our first, or our very first, I think, African-American um, uh, federal judge, William Hasty said, democracy is a journey. It is usually lost and never fully won. Its essence is eternal struggle. And, but that's that good struggle, as uh, our, our hero, John Lewis, would put it. But the idea that democracy is never finished, it is always either going forward or backward. And yes, it's been going backward. However, you know, on the voting per se in our country, um, the um, so much of what has happened in the last year is a campaign 
of, I believe it must be deliberate lies because um, there is a website that is sponsored by a conservative organization, the Heritage Foundation, which documents voter fraud instances. And if you look at just the headline of, of on that website, Heritage Foundation, that it confirms this sense, oh my God, you know, hair on fire, there's a problem. But actually my partner and I, Richard O and I, went to, into their database <laughs> and even their database trying to prove fraudulent activity shows that it's totally insignificant. And so we wrote a blog together, which our listeners could, could read. It was something entitled like, the real fraud is the scare about voter fraud. And if you just Google my name, you could see that, but it's, it's, it's an invented problem in, in the United States that the voter fraud is insignificant. So I, I just wanna really make that clear that that has been a, uh, political tool to promote that lie. Um, so I do think that um, democracy is a journey and right now um, one of the biggest questions for democracy is how do we deal with lies? Because in our country and now with social media, lies, according to an MIT study, they speed six times faster than truth. That if you, you know, one flies, the other just crawls along. And so as democracies, we say, oh, we can't interfere with freedom of speech. So what, what can be done? And I, I uh, written about it, uh, I don't know if it's published yet, but my model, or not model, I don't think, my motto is lessons, not models. We just take lessons from one another. But New Zealand, that ranks fourth in the world right under Scandinavia in the quality of its democracy on a number of scores. New Zealand has a system, let me just briefly describe it. It has a, a panel of respected um, um, board members. It's called, you can Google it and look, uh, Broadcast Standards um, Authority, BSA, Broadcast Standards Authority. And so you have a board of people led by a judge and citizens, it doesn't like, the government doesn't go out to look for lies, citizens can say, oh, this is a lie and it's dangerous and you need to look into it. And so they do every single one of the complaints, uh, the alerts, and then they judge whether or not to have it removed. And since 1989, only 11% have been removed. That shows it's very cautious, but that puts everybody on notice, right? That they could be caught. And so something like that, I think we have to evolve if lies travel six times faster than truth. And we're in this, and in, our country has been so damaged by lies under the uh, Trump administration and now continuing on the lies about our voting system. I really appreciate you clarifying that. And I, I'm, I'm sorry if I've gotten you off track at all of going into democracy. I know we're here to talk about diet for a small planet, but they're, they're so interlinked. And I mean, we could actually have a whole nother podcast just on ecological economics, which is what, what are the models that can help us uh, to be on the right side of history, what can help us with more resilience in the future. Um, and it, it sounds abstract when you say ecological economics, but it's really about those basic resources of which we've been talking about this entire time, breathing food, water, uh, um, which are the basic sustenance of, uh, of humanity. Do we have the basics to have the energy, the food, the water, the, the basic needs that, that we need to continue to be around for, uh, to sustain ourselves for future generations, but also to, to have that resilience and hard times like pandemics, like climate crises where uh, Germany, um, I, I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but Germany was extremely hard hit um, with flooding and things all created as a ripple effect um, through the climate crisis, which originally began with deforestation and agriculture, uh, ruining our soils, using too many chemicals and pesticides, weakening the soils and, and the hold uh, of that, but also because 
temperatures are rising, there's more humidity, there's more heat in the air, there's more moisture in the air. And so the storms become greater and we have these supercell storms or rain bombs that are a thousand kilometers long type of a bathtub or swimming pools of water that dump just out of one little spot, you know, hundreds of thousands of liters a second. And uh, the ground is not ready because it's been over farmed with monoculture and the, uh, the infrastructure of, of our place, uh, places here in Germany and around the world, it's not just Germany, aren't prepared for such things. And it, this didn't happen just overnight, it's happened over time, but started with agriculture, uh, food and beverage industries and how we feed ourselves and, and these infrastructures. And so I, I know we don't have time now, but I eventually would like to have you back and talk a little bit more about the, the uh, ecological economics and some different models that are emerging out there that, um, that are being adopted by people like Biden and President Biden and um, future politicians and leaders coming down the road that have this much bigger picture of, of how we can give, give humanity more resilience around the world. Because even though um, we've been discussing a lot focused on the United States and we've had some examples in different countries, we're all intertwined on this small planet. And um, the, the food that we eat in the United States or in Germany is often produced in other parts of the country at an environmental impact, uh, at a climate impact. And th eventually there is no place to hide from climate change. So we've got to come up with this more global model or a model that looks at how do we protect everyone on this planet Earth? And, and that leads me to, to really my hardest question for you today. It's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, even though this last two years, maybe we've been pulling out our hair and saying that. It's really what's the futures, plural, and even maybe more to be more specific, what I mean by that, I, I'm looking for from you and answer what does a world that works for everyone look like for you mm -hmm. well i you touched on uh this what does uh, an ecological uh, economy <laughs> look like i think the biggest barrier to forward on so many aspects of our survival um, is the mythology around the market economy. And I grew up, you know, right after, during the Cold War, and this, this myth that we only have two choices. Either we have a market economy with a rule, but that rule is highest return to existing wealth. All markets have rules. We had this very, very damaging one um, that was the, has been the primary rule. And and then we were told more or less directly that anything that bespeaks of a democracy setting boundaries around a healthy market serving all of us and sustaining the earth, that's communism, that that leads to government. The only alternative is government doing it. And we know that doesn't work. We know that fails. So, hey, it may not be perfect, but this free market economy is the best we have. So that's the trap we, we, have, to, we have to avoid. And constantly develop uh, language, uh, ecological economy, a truly democratic economy, a uh, sustainable economy in which we, we do have a voice in setting the rules. We, we all the citizens, what serves all of our interests? And that does not mean government doing everything, but it means our, our public sphere setting and enforcing the rules. And so we've had some taste of that, but in our country, there's been a, an attack, as you mentioned earlier, our Environmental Protection Agency, which is already way too dominated by, by the pesticide industry, et cetera. So really, there, uh, democracy uh, for survival has to be one that is based in ecological thriving and in which we are setting rules so that we can all thrive, including truth, 
So we have to make sure that we now that we know that on the internet that that lies speed speed ahead uh, a way a way of of communicating uh, the reality to all of us. And so I think that breaking that grip of this myth of the free market is central and then giving examples. And that's what I do in the new chapter, but I try to do in the new chapter of the new book, um, the 50th anniversary, you know, give examples of what does it look like to uh, gain income that you need for your family, but do it in a way that is nurturing and, and uh, in fact, healing the earth. And so I, I got um, really taken by the practice of agroforestry a number of years ago. And agroforestry, all it means is that, hey, we used to think that trees and crops compete, so we have to have monoculture. No, it's not true that actually trees and crops complement one another, and you can have higher yields if you have trees. And it so, makes so much sense. And the other reason I love to tell the story and to um, um, be an advocate for agroforestry is because its success, one of its biggest successes, is in the poorest country in the world, Niger, in Africa. And uh, over a few decades, they have moved, not, not everywhere, but moved through, last time I looked, it was a couple hundred million trees uh, mixed in with the crops and have proven how that can work and spread now in other parts of Africa. So I include that example. Um, and I asked one of my sources, one of the scientists, well, tell me a story that kind of captures the heart of that. And he said, oh yeah, well, I just met this little boy who said, yeah, if my mom and dad don't have food right now, then I can just go out in the field and grab some fruit. <laughs> and it's a very practical uh, story. But uh, that is, we do have examples of organizations here, the Savannah Institute in our Midwest. But I also was, was struck that Mexico, which you know I think of as not the industrialized, um, super uh, concentrated economy, that there uh, they have uh, been supporting in some level. It hasn't gone as smoothly as I wanted and as thorough as I wanted, but supporting small farmers who are experimenting and moving toward this mix of trees and crops, agroforestry. So, and I know there are a number of Scandinavian countries that are supporting this. And um, so I think that there's so much we can learn from um, the movements uh, from the bottom up, uh, like the landless workers that Anna and I visited in Brazil, the landless workers movement that they have a new um, ecology center, agroecology center, where they can get uh, information about how their farmers, and there are umpteen million of them, I forgot the number, but small farmers throughout. You, you've done um, amazing work over the years, and you and Anna both um, have worked with Mark Shepard on uh, regeneration, ag agriculture, and and uh, he has wonderful books, but there's also this one straw revolution. Uh, you wrote the foreword in there from um, Masan Ubu Fukuka. I'm not even sure how, if I'm slaughtering his name, but it's basically, um, is it Korean farming or is it Japanese? I think he's Japanese, right? That's he's Japanese, yeah. Funny that uh, it was a long time ago that I wrote that forward. I'm glad you reminded me because I want to get in touch uh, and make sure I get a copy of the new book to him and find out what he's doing because he was a real hero to me when I wrote that and it's been probably uh, 15 years. I, I always confuse the two because I use, I'm, I'm a sixth generation organic farmer, Germany's largest organic farmers, and I've switched to regenerative organic practices. And we use a lot of agro forestry and, and um, almost permaculture practices, but we use Korean natural farming practices and to try to bring indigenous microorganisms back into the the farm area and keep what's what's indigenous there and, and it sounds kind of magical but it's 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 really not it's it's a way to do a, a very natural process that's uh works well with the soil and our biome 
And so I always confuse the two, but I, I've uh, not only is Mark Shepard contributing a piece to my book, Menu B, but I'm hoping to convince you and Anna as well to maybe give a, a blurb from one of your past works in, in, in the book as well, because it's about uh, a different lens on how we see our food systems and the complexity of, uh, of global food systems reform, reformation and how we view that vital part of, of our world. And I really want to thank you. Uh, I have just really three last questions for you um, b- before we say goodbye. And they're, for, they're not for me, they're for my listeners. Um, and it's really, if you had one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? that we have power, (laughs) that every choice we make changes the world around us. And the more that that we can bring positive, joyful energy to that, the more that others will want some of what we've got, right? I mean, we, it's not as we know that we are going to affect everyone who touches us, the spirit through which we act in the world. We want people to think, oh, I want some of that, you know, not it's not a you should it's a we can look at the richness of life if we embrace a relational worldview in which we know that every choice ripples out and we can meet these needs for power meaning and connection so that's really the core theme song of my life and in doing that really in community so that often it only takes one buddy you know but find someone else who who is a fan of yours, Mark, or, you know, who you can connect with and say, okay, together we're going to make this commitment and we're going to share thoughts about what happened and who we met and how it made a difference so that we feel part of a community because I think we are social creatures, we human beings, and we need that. We need that community. So I think that idea that every choice matters, uh, we have power and we can... um, in community, even if it's only one buddy, we need that. And uh, so it's this power, meaning, and connection that uh, a relational worldview offers, this diet for a small interrelated planet offers that I want to emphasize. That is amazing. I mean, your inspiration, both your children are are active in one way or the other in their talents and abilities and it's something to be proud of, about. But you have also inspired not just me, but thousands of other people around the world to have a different lens, not just on democracy, but on food and on how we view and see our world, how we think critically, how we can find the tools that are around us in the communities to really create the futures we want. And I I thank you for that. But the question is, how would you, to those new young innovators, that new young generation that's out there, the Greta Thunberg's and even younger who are emerging, um, what should they be thinking about or what if they want to make real impacts uh, in this world, what advice do you have to push them, to steer them, to look to Mm -hmm. that they're dealing with today that you may have given to others over the years to to help them say, okay, here's how you can make an impact or here's how you can empower your life to to take a different stance. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to return to this theme of thinking of democracy as a living practice. I call it living democracy. And so we can't uh, embody in any way suggest that democracy is over there, you know, for those politicos, but it is an everyday practice that does involve the ballot box, however. And so really reclaiming democracy as a thrilling practice, not simply a dull duty and and that it is a journey and that it that it's absolutely a that that for all we can practice as you do you know as a farmer and and um, that, that we can we can embody through our food choices um, a positive relationship with the earth we have to be part of changing the rules changing the norms uh, that are is what is allowed it's not enough just us as individuals 
but we have to change the pattern. And that means social, um, democratic social change. And so that in our country, especially sidelines, corporate voice and embraces the citizen voice. So I, I just couldn't underscore that enough that whatever we're doing in our environmental organizations and our food organizations, that, that we add that democracy piece. And so we created a website here for the U.S. called democracymovement.us so that anybody anywhere in our states can plug in it, where there's a map of the, of the states. But I'm sure in your more democratic countries, because we like so far behind, I think we rank about 30th, and uh, Germany's way ahead of us. But, um, but wherever we are, we can improve, right? The voice of our democratic entity that uh, can set the rules. And that's really what we need now, wherever we are on that continuum, to set new rules, new norms that uh, protect the earth and all those intricate relationships in the soil that you're the mi down to the microorganisms. Um, so that, but let me just say, because I know we need to close that, that um, underneath it all is our willingness to step outside of our comfort zones, to set, step outside of where everybody agrees with us. And that means one thing, courage, because we are so social. You know, we, we hear, oh, you're so self-interested. No, no, no. We are so social that it's very hard to break, to do something, you know, that is outside of our, our um, social group. And that takes courage. And so a uh, number of years ago when, actually, I was listening to a, in an auditorium here in Boston where Al Gore was speaking, and he wasn't, in my view, nailing it, you know, really to nail corporate power as 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 one of the big obstacles and so i wanted to get my hand up but i couldn't because in my row everybody was like almost bowing down to his feet al gore and so my heart started going like this and so mark i said okay you're the one who reframes let's reframe that, that as inner applause and so i reframed terror fear as inner applause you know when when it do something today that makes your, your heart pound, you know, oh, am I going to look silly or feel foolish or wrong? And I got my hand up. Al Gore didn't call on me, but I knew that I, I by reframing fear as pure energy, and this is what I learned from Magar Matai, re reframing fear as pure energy that we can either use to run in the wrong direction or to break through. And this is a time, I'm going to start crying, but this is a time when our fear energy has to be put to good use, not into uh, just fear for fear's sake and making people feel trapped, but fear as energy to get us out of our comfort zones into doing that which we thought we could not do. And there we need new buddies who are gutsier than we. So we want to be courageous, bring into your life those who are gutsier than you are. Yeah, there is an immense power in that vulnerability and harnessing that fear into uh, into the right questions and the right energy to move forward, to break through. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And that was actually my last question. I, I was going to ask you, what have you experienced in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start? And I believe from the way our discussion started, it, we talked about fear. And I think that you realized that um, fear is a dual-edged uh, sword, a dual-sided uh, dual coin as well. I mean, we can use it for bad ways, or we can use it to be extremely powerful, empowered, and change our lives and, and, and harness that energy. And I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much, Frankie, for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. We could talk for hours and hours. I want to pick your brain and, and get all the other great, wonderful things you've experienced over these 50 years, but I know you're so busy and everybody's vying for your time. I wish you the most success come this September 21st on the launch of the 50th anniversary of diet for a small planet everyone please go out get a copy take a look at it try the recipes but more importantly take frankie's advice to heart embrace that fear use it as a strength and uh, have the courage 
Thank you so much, Frankie. Thank you. What a great honor. Uh, and I love talking to you. So thank you for all you do and all the wisdom that you bring to your listeners. You offer so much. Thanks so much. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.